Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack Intern. I hope that you're doing well. I hope you're having a great start to this week. I'd like to discuss The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov uh, because it's an outstanding novel, one I just finished rereading uh, this weekend. It is an absolute masterpiece. Um, it is in the pantheon of satire. It is you know, not just a modernist masterpiece. I think on some levels it's, it's a postmodernist masterpiece. Uh, it has intertextuality to a degree that uh, most writers aspire to and very, very few achieve. It's a totem of magical realism. Uh, the humor in this book is horrible. It is so dark. It is so dark that I think it inspired Spinal Tap. I mean, when I asked the question, how much more black could the comedy in The Master and Margarita be? I certainly feel like the appropriate answer is none more black. Um, the book is absolutely vicious as a satire. It is a book that Bulgakov wrote knowing he would never see published. He wrote it for the drawer. Um, it was, you know, sort of written in secret. Uh, he, it was going to be published posthumously. And he knew that. And that gave him the freedom to be able to write uh, in startling detail about Stalinist Russia and Stalinist Moscow. It gave him the ability to have, you know, uh, uh, the, the poverty that so many people are experiencing, the desperation that so many people are experiencing, to write about that with, with a, a great deal of authenticity, uh, the dread that people could experience in his society. And he writes about all that. But he also it gives him the audacity and the freedom to write about supernatural occurrences occurring in Stalinist Russia, <laughs> of having, you know, the devil appear, of having ch chapters, plural, in which Jesus and Pilate are characters. Um, and it, it does all of those things. And yet, to me, the most audacious part is not that he's willing to write this wild satire or to bring in all of these you know, magical influences, these supernatural influences, uh, and, and put them all together and let them stew and brew uh, with amazing, amazing results. The most audacious part of The Master and Margarita to me is that in some of the darkest times, uh, in, in a time where Bulgakov legitimately could fear for his life, where he knew people who feared for their lives or lost their lives, um, and as, you know, storm clouds and, and true horrors are gathering, not just over Soviet Russia, but over all of Europe and the world, Bulgakov had the audacity to create happy endings for some of the characters in this book. That, to me, is the most audacious piece. The, the, the most beautiful part of the book is not just all of the, the really wild <laughs> and strange things that Bulgakov is going to present us with. And it's not the satire and, and the ways he just will repeatedly stick the knife in. Um, it is the fact that even through all of that, at the ending, Bulgakov can look and he looks for a dawn. He looks for a new dawn and he has characters looking for a new dawn. Um, and it's why I, I can come back and reread this book, as, as vicious as the satire can be. I can reread it and love rereading this book um, just, just because of, the, of that sense of, of humanity and hope that Bulgakov has. So very briefly, we're, we're presented with uh, numerous characters across the book. We don't actually meet the Master and Margarita for uh, well over 100 pages. Um, initially, we're introduced to a, uh, a, a poet and an intellectual who are just having this conversation and they, you know, they're intellectuals. So they bring up Kant and all sorts of stuff around, you know, does the devil exist? Or of course the devil doesn't exist. This is Stalinist Russia. The devil doesn't exist. And then, um, you know, the devil and the devil's minions show up and all hell breaks loose. A uh, good portion of the book is essentially <laughs> the devil and various, you know, associates of the devil giving people exactly what they want. So people are poor, they want money. Well, they get money. And then it turns out that the money's, you know, turns into other stuff. Like it turns into <laughs> birds or it, it just turns into nonsense. Um, and the, the, the avarice that um, that Bulgakov is willing to show characters having in Moscow, you know, at a time where uh, the great leader is saying that things are good, you know, brighter days are just around the corner. And Bulgakov is showing that people don't actually feel that way and that when they get a cash grab, they want to they have fun and do something with it. Uh, the ways he's willing to critique his society um, are, are just astounding. Um, but the, the supernatural aspects are really interesting. The way that um, Bulgakov is taking what we think of as the Faust legend and he's playing with it. He's playing with it and probing with it. And I think that's, that's sort of influence one that a lot of readers can pick up on in The Master of Margarita is, hey, the devil shows up. And even Margarita, um, you know, associates, that, that name associates with Gretchen from Gareth's Faust, uh, specifically Faust Part One. Um, what we don't necessarily see is Faust as a main character. 
uh, within you know this Faust legend, and that I think is is one of the um, cooler aspects as well. The intertextuality is there, but Bulgakov is playing playing the notes in a new way, and in a way that I don't know anybody else has ever really retold the Faust legends. And I think that's a, that's a true strength of the book. Uh, you know, there, there's so much to appreciate about it, but with it going into sort of the the influences and looking at the Faust legend. Um, the way Bulgakov is willing to pull back, and the master is very much not the not the main character, not the main agent uh, within the book, is is a really interesting choice and an interesting aspect. Um, another key influence, and and it's so obvious and so palpable throughout the book, is of course Nikolai Gogol, uh, the great Russian writer, both short story writer. He had, had a great play. He wrote Dead Souls, and Dead Souls feels like a huge influence. But I would also add. Um, the stories, the strange, strange stories that uh, Gogol has. The fact that there's a character who's haunted by a noseless executioner brings up Gogol's story, the nose. Um, and I think there, there are some ways in which the master uh, is seen by Bulgakov, not just as, as an emblem of Bulgakov himself, but as this other alternative version of Gogol. Of, a man who writes a masterpiece and then burns the manuscript, just as Gogol did. A man who is, you know, con condemned to a mental institution and, you know, is regarded as a madman, not unlike Gogol. And so those, those aspects occur. But the poet we're introduced to at the very beginning, Ivan, um, I think in some ways he's seen as almost this, like, po possible next Gogol. The next in this line of if we have Gogol and then we have Bulgakov putting himself in as writing the sequel to Dead Souls to a certain extent. Then we have this Ivan as this possible future, you know, Gogol Bulgakov descendant, um, spiritual heir, who will write the next, you know, great Russian strange supernatural masterpiece um, after Dead Souls and Master and Margarita. And, and Bulgakov is very intentional in that. And that's why I say it, there, there are these aspects of postmodernism where Bulgakov seems to be inserting himself, but inserting himself in in um, both hyper idealized and hyper like depressed versions of himself within the narrative um, and claiming this affinity with Nikolai Gogol. Uh, and I think that's really interesting. De Dead Souls, um, the way it was structured to almost theoretically mirror Dante's Divine Comedy, where there would sort of be this, you know, inferno that is Dead Souls, and then this second book would have been sort of a purgatorio where we see the character working towards goodness. Um, all of that's sort of crammed into here. There's a there there is a deep intertextuality with Dante's Inferno, not just the night where um, Margarita, as you know, the devil's queen on this midnight, you know, the chapter is titled Satan's Ball, is going to encounter all of these horrible people from history, all of these accused poisoners and such. Um, but and and that very much recalls like Dante going through the Inferno. But what's really strange is the way that um, I think Bulgakov takes that, that, that sense within the Divine Comedy of Dante is not worthy, but through Beatrice's love for Dante, she imputes worthiness to him. Um, in, in the same way that Dante wants to show, like, you know, God imputing worth to, um, to, to humans who, who are, you know, sinful. Um, Bulgakov has Margarita, to a large extent, be the Beatrice. She's the one who imputes goodness to the master and, and, and imputes worth to the master and recognizes his masterpiece and wants to have him recalled and have his masterpiece recalled, have the manuscript, you know, somehow be brought back even though it was burned. Um, and so there's a sense in which Margarita has to be the Dante. She has to be the pilgrim. It's not just that she is, you know, giving the worth, but she is going to be the one who also earns the worth. She is the, she's the really the, the main character across that second piece. Um, it's her agency, her choices. It is Gretchen redeeming Faust, not just out of this like final bit of love at the very end when Faust is just still, you know, awful. But it is it is much more um, it is much more her agency, her power that uh, and her her choices made multiple times that allow that to happen. Um, and I think that inversion is part of what makes. The Master and Margarita, such a fascinating book to read, um, is is the character of Margarita much more than any of the other characters. Uh, the the various minions of the devil are alternately histor hysterical and absolutely terrifying. Uh, that one is always running around in this ridiculous checked you know blazer, 
uh, the, there's one who has this like fang that's always popping out. One is a cat that repeatedly talks and acts as a human. Um, and so all of those, <laughs> all of those minions are just, they, they are totally ridiculous. And yet every time they do something, they're terrifying. Uh, we really do get a sense of hell when literally Moscow goes up in flames in sections of the city uh, in certain parts of the book. And, and that descent is uh, is really quite harrowing. It, it, we're laughing time and time again, but we're also shaking our head time and time again. And then we're reeling as we see the total destruction um, that Bulgakov is, is showing that I think to a certain extent he feels his society deserves. And that, um, and, and not the, the people that deserve it, but the leadership and, and society that has been created uh, needs to be burned down on some level. And so there, there's so much to enjoy in this book. Um, there's so much to, to be fascinated by and to, to come back and reread uh, and, and sort of rediscover. Uh, but there's also just absolutely beautiful, beautiful language. Um, and I, just as one, Quick example of that. Margarita could not have said what his horse's bridle was made of, but thought it might be chains of moonlight, and the horse itself was a mass of darkness, and the horse's mane a storm cloud, and the rider's spurs the white flecks of stars. Uh, <laughs> just after 300 pages of, of madness and hysteria and um, moments of, of, of genuine warmth and humanity, we're then treated to those images, to a final dance macabre. Uh, that outdoes Ingmar Bergman in The Seventh Seal and, and, and any other dance macabre uh, because it's a dance macabre that is, is hopeful. Um, so there are many books I mentioned in... Uh, and read this book if you haven't, please. It, it's a great one. Uh, I did enjoy this translation by Pevier and Volkanovsky. Um, I can't remember who had done the translation I read about 10, 12 years ago, but I, I really enjoyed this one. It definitely captured that sense of of poetry and beauty that exists um, in the cracks of the narrative. Uh, but there are many books I mentioned. I said, of course, that uh, Gerth's Faust is a massive, massive influence on the book. And I'm not always a huge fan of, of uh, Gerth's Faust. I prefer Faust Part Two, And that spirit that's in Faust Part Two, that energy is uh, closer to Master Margarita, though the plot, the influences are from Faust Part One. Of course, Gogol, um, Dead Souls, ma massive wounds. Uh, the short story V from Gogol would be another one. There's a great bit where there's sort of that midnight, you know, ride uh, across the stars with the, with the witches and such. And that brought to mind uh, the story V from Gogol. Another great, great book, uh, not from a Russian, but set in Russia, would be The Kremlin Ball by Curcio Malaparte, which shows uh, Russian society um, around a contemporary time to when Bulgakov was writing. And so the way that uh, Malaparte writes, there, it's characters see um, individuals who have, uh, who, who have a, a family member or a friend who has, you know, disappeared, either been murdered or taken to, you know, be tortured or gulag or something. Um, and they, when they see them, they smell death on those people that they see. Uh, and so that sense of, you know, dread is very uh, clear in both the Kremlin Ball and um, Master Margarita. The ways in which characters just disappear and then there's just preposterous stories and lies made up reflect, of course, the lies that were told to families um, and told to, you know, colleagues and co-workers and friends when people just disappeared off the streets um, and, and were murdered. Uh, the Notebooks of Victor Serge, of course, uh, sort of, again, mirror that same contemporary society and, and the horrors that were attendant upon them. Uh, somewhat later work, um, but sort of carrying through that tradition, would be um, the Kolima stories from Varlam Shalomov, which are set in, like, work camps um, and show, you know, that, that other side of, of Soviet society that we don't get in Master Margarita. The dread hovers over the book, um, but the, these stories illustrate what that type of life actually was like for people. And of course, there is a um, there are many ways that different writers will try to approach uh, totalitarian regimes and re deeply, deeply repressive regimes. Bulgakov's method was to write his uh, write his novel and not publish it. 
and, but also to put in the, all these magical realist components and, and, and this deep satire. Uh, writing a little bit earlier, uh, Evgeny Zamitin's We shows a science fiction <laughs> portrayal of a, uh, a very dark utopia, you know, utopia um, that is, is deeply critical of totalitarian regimes, both czarist and, um, you know, uh, the communist regime. But there are, uh, I think, other writers as well, specifically um, within Argentina, uh, Manuel Puig's Kiss of the Spider Woman, which has characters um, in an Argentine prison. Uh, Resistance from Julian uh, Fuchs. And then uh, the uh, short story um, House Taken Over by Julio Cortazar. I'll link my uh, uh, video where I discuss that story. Of course, the magical realism is, is, is wonderful, um, and it's something that can be very fun and can relieve some of the dread and tension within the book. Uh, writers like Gabriel Garcia Marquez and 100 Years of Solitude, um, Italo Calvino. I was I kept thinking of the Cloven Viscount, the way that sort of a, a character could be cut in half and have the good and the bad. That, that felt um, appropriate. The uh, short stories of Isaac Bashev Singer uh, which many of which take place in Tsarist Russia, in uh, the Russian Pale, where the rural areas where um, uh, Jewish people were able to live. That sense of, of, of the supernatural. And I think a key point is that one of, the, one of the things I feel when I read Gerth is that he doesn't really believe that a demon exists or the devil exists. Like Mephistopheles isn't real to Gerth. And so that carries through in the text. Whereas with Bulgakov, it feels like he feel maybe maybe Stalin and the secret police are are the devil, but there is a devil um, for for Bulgakov, and that that sense carries in his book, and I think it carries in Singer to a certain extent. Um, I was also reminded of uh, Gogol's Wife by Tomasa Landolfi, <laughs> um, and then two last quick ones. Another work that, that sort of is somewhat contemporary would be um, In Human Land by Joseph uh, Zhapsky, which is um, a detail uh, written by someone who was a Polish POW uh, from the early year of World War II. And then after um, Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union, the Poles were, the POWs were released to sort of help, help the Soviet Union. And he was one of the officers who helped sort of understand track down the Polish POWs and realize how many, how few of them were left um, and, and what had happened um, and, and sort of his his story. And then, of course, it would be worth noting that if there's Kant comes in for some jokes with the critique of practical reason, <laughs> uh, which I, I reread the, the abridged versions of that um, while I was reading Master and Margarita just because it was so fun. So um, Master and Margarita, just a fantastic book, one that I highly highly recommend. Um, but let me know if you've read it. Let me know if there are other magical realist books you enjoy. Um, I'd probably be reading We in the next month or two and maybe Resistance. I don't know. Or Kiss the Spider-Man. I, 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 I feel like uh, I, I want a little bit more in this vein, but a different, a different writer's take. So we'll see. But again, I hope everybody's well. Thank you.